Hi, I'm Bob Knoten. On this episode of the Camp Chaos Chronicles, I'm going to start putting together the bottom end of the TWR 6.1 liter V12. This one's going to be different. Dang it. Now to the casual observer, things aren't going to look a whole lot different than they normally do with a standard garden variety 5.3 liter XJS V12 engine. But I'm gonna see some differences. And first of all, we've got a crankshaft that's been stroked to 80 millimeters. And also, the bearing clearances that I normally use, which are uh, pretty tight down toward the end of the specification so that we can push oil out to the connecting rods and also push oil through the bypass, through the cooler, back to the crankcase to keep the oil as cool as possible. Uh, but in this case, the clearances are going to be more, depending on which bearing. The back bearing takes a significantly wider clearance. Uh, because this is an engine that is going to be spun a lot faster more often and it does produce significantly more power it's more of a race engine application so let's see what the differences are specifically between a standard 5.3 crankshaft and the 6.1 TWR unit now what we have here is two crankshafts that look very similar this is similar to the one that's in the E-Type engine right now. I just pulled this one out of crankshaft corner for as a comparison to what we have there in the TWR 6.1 liter. And it's um, pretty dirty. That's why it's in crankshaft corner. But this is just what a standard Jaguar V12 crankshaft looks like. Now the thing about Jaguar B12 crankshafts in the 5.3 liter range. To my knowledge, all of these crankshafts are forged and all of them have been hardened by the nitriding process. And uh, that needs to be, if you're going to have these crankshafts ground undersized, they need to be rehardened. A very important thing. Now, if we look here, we've got this number. EAC 2757FA. Now, if we look over here at the TWR 6.1 liter crankshaft, this one has been stroked. Now, initially I was wondering, okay, did they come up with a special forging and tooling for this? But if you look at the crankshaft, it says EAC 2757FA. Same as that right there. So how do they come up with an 80 millimeter stroker crank for this engine? Well, <clears throat> as I said initially, I thought they might have made a special uh, set of tooling for this, but the fact is that they took these crank pin journals, they welded them on the side that they're going to be moving the stroke to, and uh, then had it ground offset. The same size as the original, but a few millimeters outward from the center line of the crank. Now, how do we know that they welded these? Well, look right there. You can see gas bubbles that uh, were created by the welding process. Um, not sure what to say about the gas bubbles, but I got to, in terms of integrity of the crankshaft, but the fact is that they did this on a lot of engines, so we're going to go with it. I don't know how you would avoid that. The TWR crankshaft had been stored out of the engine in a salt water environment next to an ocean and it was very badly rusted. It had to be ground 10 thousandths under. They were ground 10 thousandths under to begin with because they were welded cranks and there's always going to be a little bit of distortion that goes along with that process. So originally it was ground 10 thousandths under so we ground it another 10 thousandths under so that we had to buy 20 thousandths under bearings for it. Yeah, it's been magnafluxed, checked for cracks, and this is ready to go in. 
A couple of things to note here. First of all, you can see that I've got the standard rear main seal sizing tool installed. Every time I go by it, I give it a give it a squeeze uh, or a turn a little bit in order to help it seat. I installed this a couple of weeks before I really need to install the crankshaft so that it's got plenty of time to get the idea that it's a rear main seal and it needs to be a certain size. The other thing you'll notice is that there's sort of a gray finish on the bearings. I sprayed these with a little dry film lubricant in order to get exactly the clearances that I want. The dry film lubricant is a great thing. If you ever start the engine up dry, like it's been sitting for a long, long time, uh, the dry film lubricant is really a good thing to prevent the bearings from wearing. 50% of your bearing wear occurs on startup. And the longer the engine sits, the worse that uh, issue is going to be. So let's go ahead and stick this crank in. thing you'll notice when even after you size this seal back here is that it takes a certain amount of torque in order to uh, overcome the friction of that seal and uh, about 35 pounds of torque is about what you want to see roughly um, it may take a few pounds more, maybe up to 50 in order to get it to break loose initially, but after that it should stabilize between 35 and 40 foot pounds. And as you, and you'll notice that I then went to the front and worked my way back. And that is because, uh, well, initially, if I had enough room to put the torque wrench up here, what that would do is, uh, if I didn't have this cap in here, as I tried to turn it, the uh, resistance back here would cause the front of the crankshaft to climb up on the bearing shell. So, and you don't want that. Now in this case right here where I've got the ability to torque back here because I can't get the torque wrench in between the this particular engine stand and the crank, uh, I made this special tool back here that I can bolt into the back of the crankshaft. And that's not quite so important. Uh, but I do it anyway. It's just the process that I use. And as you go along here, you shouldn't notice any increase in torque as you go back or as you add bearing. If you notice any increase, maybe you swap some bearing caps because remember this, this whole setup, the, the main bearing bores after these caps are bolted on at the uh, machine shop, uh, they ran a hone through here to get the bores all uh, all lined up and get them round after they had taken a little bit off of the bottom of each one of these caps. And uh, that cap will only work on that particular bearing. About half of them you can't mistake for anything else. This one back here, of course, uh, you're not going to mistake that. On uh, the one in front, it's got a boss on the front here for the oil pump to fit in. And also this one in the middle here is uh, wider. And these four right here, you could actually, you could actually get them swapped around. But the thing is, they're stamped with numbers one, two, three, and four. You'll see that I've got one through seven here, but that's for the benefit of the form uh, when I'm taking measurements and so forth. But uh, if you get these swapped around, it could be that 
there's a little bit of offset then, and that could actually cause your, your uh, bearing to seize on the crankshaft. So you want to keep track of that as you go along to make sure that you don't have an increase in torque. Another thing that I got to reiterate is that this thing right here, this, this uh, middle cap, this one has the two thrust washers in that go in the block in between the crank and the block itself. Um, I had one engine where those were not installed. In fact, when I pulled the pan off, there were a couple of thrust washers in there with about a 90 to 100 degree, 180 degree twist in them. What happened was the mechanic had forgot to do it, saw them laying on the bench, and then twisted them and threw them in the pan thinking when somebody, uh, when the next person took them apart that somehow these things got loose in here and got mangled and that would somehow explain his or cover up his ineptitude. So you got it. I mean, they got to be in there. If not, and that's what happened in this particular case was the crankshaft ground on the sides of this particular bearing saddle on the block and the block was unusable. So what else can we talk about? Oh yeah, you'll notice that I used this impact uh, during the installation of the nuts. I did not use this to bang them in place. I just use this to run them down. In fact, what I normally do is I use a, a drill. You don't want to be using this to bang the nuts down because you want to have any clamping force being provided in a nice even manner. So again, this is used just to spin the nuts on and off. You'll notice that there's oil in all these locations. It's really important that you oil the threads and also the washers so that all the torque that you apply here is being used to provide clamping force and not just overcoming friction between the various parts here. So what I do is I torque the two big nuts to 30. The spec fully tight is 62 foot-pounds. So I torque these halfway. These are to be tightened to 28 eventually. I torque those halfway to 14. So I go 30, 30, 14, 14. Then I go back to here, 62, 62, 28, 28. If you were to torque this fully to 62 and then torque this one, you could potentially distort the cap. So we want to avoid that if at all possible. So that's how I put a bottom end together. Doesn't take long, but you got to pay attention to the details. So now it's time to get the pistons and liners set up to install. And that's going to be next week's project. Now, if you like videos like this, like, subscribe, and maybe leave some comments down below so that we can know what we can do to do what we do better. And we'll see you the next time on the Camp Chaos Chronicles.